Father, I pray that the reality of what Christ has done, what he has accomplished, would be fresh in our, our minds and our hearts today. Fill us up, I pray, in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen. amen. And you can have a seat in the presence of the Lord. I only have one football analogy today, and I'm just going to say it. It might be off because you guys know I don't know much about football. But there is a myth out there that when Tom Brady was drafted to the NFL in 2000, he said, I'm the greatest decision this organization has ever made. That's, a, that's, a, that, that's out there. Just go on the Internet. You'll, I'm the, imagine saying that on the day you're drafted. I'm the greatest decision that this organization has ever made. How many Patriot fans do we have here today? Thank you. <laughs> Mary, you can leave now. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Anyways, I, I didn't know. I thought that was really going to get... Anyways. Um, Unfortunately, Tom Brady is disputing that he ever even said that. But when you look back at his career, it is really one of the greatest decisions that that organization has ever made. Once again, I know nothing of football, but if you're a Patriots fan, then you know all the stories. You know how many rings he has. You know all of the lies and the rumors. You know about the deflate gate. Some people know about that. You know about his dynasty, the Tom Brady. He might be the GOAT. To some people, I don't know. Is he? Is he the goat? Oh, no, Patriots fan. Anyways, I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna start moving back into the word. I really thought that was gonna go over better with the football fans. Either way, we love talking about mythical characters. You know, for me, and maybe it was Jordan coming up, growing up here. It's like a myth, but. We only love talking about mythical characters if it's a subject that we love, which is the reason why when I'm talking about Tom Brady, you all aren't flying with me because you don't love the Patriots. You only want to talk about myths of people that you love. But if you were a Torah observant Jew in the first century, they had a mythical character of their own. They had an individual that they would tell stories about, an individual that meant a lot to their religion, and he only has a few lines of scripture where they talk about him, and the story went a little bit like this, and it can't, comes out of Genesis chapter 14. And in that chapter, the man Abraham has a nephew named Lot. You might remember Lot as the guy who chose to go live in Sodom and Gomorrah. And when God brings his anger down on that city, he leaves and his wife turns around, turns into a pillar of salt. How many people here remember Lot? Good. Yeah, the Bible actually says that. Remember Lot. That's a, a verse in the Bible. Well, Lot was captured at a certain point when the kings of the city-states of Sodom and Gomorrah and Abma and Zeboim and Zoar, they were defeated in an attempt to free themselves from serving this king named uh, Keter Loamar, who was the king of Elam. And the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, where Lot was living, they fled in this route. And when they fled, that king captured Lot and his family. And this is Abraham's nep nephew. And when Abraham heard about this, he marches with his men overnight. And Abraham had 318 men, the Bible tells us, and they divide it into two camps, and they come in, and, and they rout this army, and the forces start fleeing, because Abraham is coming back to get his nephew Lot. And when those armies started to flee, they leave all of their gods, and all of their money, and all of their possessions where they were at. And so Abraham and all of his crew come in, and they start collecting all of this booty. You know, they the treasures, they got it all now, and, and, and they're coming back. And everything is fine and dandy, and we could just leave with that story. All of us are crystal clear. But what happened next has gone down through the history of Jewish storytelling. In Genesis 14, I'll read it to you so you, we can all be on the same page. In verse 17, it says, After Abraham returned from defeating Kedor Laomar and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Sheva, which is the king's valley. And then it says, And then Melchizedek, the king of Salem brings out bread and wine. He was a priest 
of God Most High. This is the name El Elyon. It's one of the ways God likes to be referred to as the Most High God. And it, this guy, it says he is a priest of God Most High, and he looks at the person that God called out of Ur, and he said, God gave him the promises, I'm going to give you land, I'm going to make your descendants multiply. This is the father of the faith of whom I'm going to send my own son through your seed. He, and Abraham, it says, the Bible says, Melchizedek looks at this great father of the faith, and he blessed him. He says, blessed be Abraham by God most high, the creator of heaven and earth. And praise be to God most high who delivered your enemies into your hand. And then Abraham looks at all of the stuff that he's gathered from this victory. And he takes, the, the, uh, Hebrews actually says, he takes the best of the plunder and he gives it over to Melchizedek. Who is this guy that the father of our faith would give an offering to. Who is Melchizedek? So you have this priest, and, and he's also a king named Melchizedek. Look at someone and say, Melchizedek. He was from a town called Salem. And Salem is a word that means peace. Later, the city is called Yer Salem, or Jeru Salem, or the city of peace, that's what Jer Jerusalem stands for, the city of peace. And Melchizedek, his own name is also a play on words because Melech in the Hebrew is the word for king. And Zedek or Zedek is the word for righteousness. So you have this king of righteousness who's from a town called peace. I love this. Let me say it like this. You have the king of righteousness from a town called Peace who shows up with bread and wine. I, I just love that. I don't know why I love that. But I love, I almost want to go to the end of my message right now because you're already there. Oh, anywho. This is very mysterious if you didn't know who Jesus was. Further, the earliest biblical accounts that we have show that most kings also served as priests. Or, and, and don't get weird when we say the word priest. A priest is just someone who is a mediator between God and men. So if you're, I'm talking to God in your stead, I'm just a priest. I'm, I'm communicating with God back and forth. I'm a mediator between God and men. But most kings were also priests. We realize that Moses was designated as the leader of all of Israel, but he also served as the mediator between God and men. Did he not? So in essence, you can say he is a king and he's also See, David crossed this barrier so much, he yearned, he, he was one of those kings that yearned to get the ark of God back in his house. He fought to get the ark of God. And when the ark came back, he started putting on the ephod, the priestly garments, and was dancing before the people because the ark was coming back into the house. So you see the kings operating as priests and interceding before the people, before God. And when you go back to Moses, have you ever wondered why the tribe of Levi functioned as priests? Why was it that tribe? Why not Judah? Sounds good. They're the praise. You know, pray. Judah means praise. Why not the praise? Why is it the tribe of Levi and his brother Aaron? Well, I'm going to let you know why. When Moses went up on Mount Sinai to get the law, to get the, the tablets, and he's meeting with God, guess what happened on the ground below? Does anybody know? They, they, they decided to take their gold off and they made them a calf, a golden calf, right? While Moses is up on the top. And when Moses comes down, I want to read this from uh, Exodus 32. I want to read this in verse 25 so you can hear what happens. Moses comes down, he sees that all of the people are running wild and that Aaron had let them get out of control and so become a laughing stock to their enemies. So he stood at the entrance to the camp and listen to what he says. This is so, man, this is so crazy. Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all of the Levites rallied to him. This is important. And he said to them, 
This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says to the Levites now. He says, each of you strap a sword to your side, go back and forth through the camp from one end to the other, killing your brothers and friends and neighbors. What? And the Levites did as the Lord commanded. And that day, about 3,000 of the people died. And Moses said, you have been set apart to the Lord today, for you were against your own sons and brothers, and God has blessed you this day. That's a heavy verse in Scripture, is it not? But God's like the people who stood up against this grave apostasy. Those are the people I want serving me at my house. Oh, man. So Moses ordained the tribe of Levi to serve, Aaron and the tribe of Levi, to serve before the Lord as priest. This is the first time where we really see a distinct separation of functions. It's where nobody other than the appointed priestly tribe and the families of Levi and Aaron were able to offer sacrifices and mediate between the people and God. So you now have a separation from Moses and the tribe of Levi. Are you all hearing me so, much, so far? Moses is the God-ordained leader, but now you have priests that are serving and offering the sacrifices before God. See, in Christ, we see a return of the concept of the royalty and the priesthood abiding in the same individual. The kingship and the priesthood are coming back together in Christ, just like the king Melchizedek, who is a priest of, the God, of God Most High, El Elyon, the Most High God. So he is a king, if you're taking notes, Melchizedek is a king and priest of God Most High. Everybody got that first point. Are you learning something today? We're going to go a little bit further in, into this. The second thing we find out about Melchizedek, if you're taking notes, is that he has no genealogy or death record. And this is very important. A common way of arguing in a Jewish setting would be to argue from silence. And the Bible, it, what I read to you in Genesis 14 is all we have of Melchizedek. And the Bible, the Bible never mentions his birth. It never mentions his death. It never mentions his family, who his brothers and sisters are. It's just mysterious. And so the writer of Hebrews just continues in this vein, and it goes to follow. He was without beginning or end of days of life. He never died. He never came to be, and he never died. And, and in Psalm 110, it brings this thought up. And this is the passage that Hebrews chapter 7 is quoting in Psalm 110 verse 4. It says, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You, this is a messianic psalm. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Forever. Look at someone and say forever. Mm. Here's the implication. If Melchizedek has no known beginning or no known ending, then he must live forever. Why does that matter? I'll tell you why. Because if you were designated as a priest of God, you would only remain a priest as long as you were alive. That makes sense, doesn't it? Like after you die, you can't be a priest anymore. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, that's just the way it works. You, you would, it, it, the only way, but, but it's also like being like a made person. You can't just walk away from the priesthood. The only way out of this gig is to die. That's the only way you can get out. That means that the priesthood of Mel, Melchizedek has never ended. Y'all still with me? And it never began. It never ended. And it never began. It always is. It always was. It always will be. We're going somewhere. 
And in verse 3, the writer of Hebrews says, without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. Do you realize in chapter 1, this is exactly what the writer of Hebrews says. He says, your throne, O God, ever and ever, all will perish, but you will remain. See, Christ is in the order of Melchizedek because his priesthood, say that again, Miss King, we didn't hear you in the front. His priesthood will never end because his life will never end. That, if you, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I want to jump ahead so bad. I'm going to stay right in my lane right now. We could get into more of this, but not right now. But so if you're taking notes, he's a priest and king, number one, of God Most High. Number two, he has no genealogy, no death record. He, he will, it's a perpetual priesthood that Melchizedek is a part of. The third point our author wants us to know about Melchizedek is this. Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek. See, this is an argument which is from the lesser to the greater. According to Jewish belief, now listen, listen church, the children or generations that were yet unborn were still within the loins of their forefathers. Are you guys getting the reasoning right here? If you, uh, my child Xavier was, you know, in my loins before he was ever born. So if I do something, it's almost as if he's doing it. Y'all tracking with me so far? This is just, I know this isn't how we argue, but this is how a Jewish person would have been arguing. So Levi, all of the tribes of Levi, Levi was in his granddaddy Abraham. The priesthood was inside of Abraham. All, all of the descendants were inside of Abraham when Abraham decides to give an offering to Melchizedek. See, the Levites, by law, by law, they were required to receive tithes from the people, and they were honored in that sense. They didn't have any land of their own. Their job was to serve the, the King of kings and the Lord of lords at his tabernacle. So the people of Israel were forced to bring in the tithes by law so that those individuals would be able to live. And they were designated to, by God to perform this task in the life of Israel of offering these sacrifices to God. No one else could perform this function unless you wanted to get stoned or killed. You had to be in the tribe of Levi to offer a sacrifice to God. And these sacrifices were to be provided by the people by means of their tithes that they would bring. And these priests were inside of Abraham giving tithes to Melchizedek. So the lesser, which would have been Aaron and the Levites, were blessed by one who was greater, named Melchizedek. And it says in one case, the tenth is collected by people who die, the, Le the Levitical priesthood. This is in verse eight, 8 of what we just read. But in the other case, by him who is declared to be living. God declared him alive forever. How many people feel like they're in a, in, in a classroom today? That's okay. That's fine. You got to track with me. I know you thought it was Super Bowl Sunday. You got all your food lined up. You said, we're just going to go and rejoice. And now this brother wants us to think about something. That's fine. Because we're going somewhere. Touch somebody and say, we're going somewhere. Verse 11. If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, and indeed, the law given to the people established that priesthood. Why was there still need for another priest to come? One in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron. For when the priesthood is changed, the law must also be changed. He of who these things are said belonged to a different tribe, and no one from that tribe served at the altar. For it's clear that our Lord descended from Judah. And in regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. And what we said is more clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears, one who come, becomes a priest not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry, but on the power of an indestructible life. For it is declared you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek, and listen to this, this writing. You want to know why the Jews were, 
why the Christians were persecuted. Listen to this. He says, the former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless. For the law made nothing perfect. Look at someone say perfect. The law made nothing perfect. And a better hope has been introduced. And if you grasp this, you can draw near to God. If the author of Hebrews had a thesis, this would be it. And you can write this down if you want. The purpose of religion is to bring the worshiper back into the presence of a holy God by means of a cleansed conscience having been made holy or sanctified. The, the purpose of religion is to bring a worshiper back into the presence of Almighty God, and the only way you can get back into his presence is if your filthy, dirty conscience has been cleansed. The writer of Hebrews would call this concept perfection. That would be perfection. See, this idea of my conscience being cleansed, perfection, the law could not accomplish it. It could never get me to that place. Year after year, it would never cleanse you. You would just have to drag your animals back to the altar. Well, what did, oh, Rich, you brought a pretty big bull this time. What did you do this year? Everyone's looking. That's a pretty big sacrifice, Rich. Because every time you would walk to the tabernacle with your animal, everyone would be looking at you with their animals too. Hey, Bill. Hey. Yep. You just... Making the animal. You would never be cleansed. It was only a reminder of the sin you could never escape. <laughs> Day of atonement again. Here we go. Some of you all ha would have a few more animals than me. And that's fine. <laughs> but we all got animals. church. His argument is this. As a result of the victorious resurrection of Jesus from the dead, there is something that is available to us. It's now available and we now have the power to cleanse our conscience. You have been sanctified, past tense, the Bible says. You are made holy. You are right before God. Once this writer sees Jesus and the fullness of who he is, he realizes something. The law was just a tutor. It was a schoolmaster, Galatians says. If you study what they were doing and walking in, it was just showing us to the reality of a sacrifice that is so perfect. It's perfect. If we sprinkle that blood, our conscience will be cleansed. Perfection. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit, how many people here are saved? Just by a show of hands. If you're not, I challenge you to find Jesus today. But if you are saved, the Holy Spirit begins to speak to your soul, doesn't he? And you realize that the veil has been torn. This isn't a problem for us because we never walked around with bulls and stuff. You take it for granted that you talk to Jesus in your car. And that the Holy Spirit witnesses to your spirit that you are blessed and you are a believer. And the veil has been torn. We, we listen, which means we now have access. We have access to our daddy. Oh my 
goodness. These are the very words of Jeremiah in chapter 31. He says, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and the people of Judah. It won't be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and I brought them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant. You all remember that? Though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord, he says, this is the covenant I will make. I will put my law in their minds and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people and no longer will they teach their neighbor that you need to know the Lord. They will all know me. Oh my goodness, from the least to the greatest declares the Lord for I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, I don't need a lesson on God today because I can talk to him because I have access. See, and if we are perfected and our conscience is cleansed and the intimacy of the Holy Spirit reveals that to us, and none of us have to bring animals. And if Christ accomplished all of this, then he is, he's not just a high priest. He is the greatest of all high priests. He is the best mediator we could have ever asked for. He is the, uh, no, no, no. If you got a reality of what has happened, you would say, don't, you cannot take away this priesthood. No one's going to take my Jesus from me. This is a better priest. There's a problem, though. There's a big problem. We all know in the law, the high priest must be from the order of the Levites. He must be in the family of Aaron. But he's the best high priest. The only way this could work is if there's a new priesthood, there must be a new law. This law, it's not going to function anymore. We need something better. So certain were they of this. Now, you're talking about, you want to talk about killing a sacred cow. Then you stand up in Jerusalem in, in the year 20. <laughs> and say, the law can't fix nothing. We need a new law. We need something different. We, they were demanding that the law be set aside because we need this high priest. You gotta move the law. You want, that's why they were being persecuted because you're, you're killing off this thing that defined the Jewish religion. But he says in verse 12, for when the priesthood is changed, the law must be changed. And listen to the strength of this verse in verse 19. The law made nothing perfect. It was weak and useless. It never brought a single person into a restored relationship with God the Father and his children, but this high priest has done it. He's introduced to us a better hope by which, the Bible says, we draw near to God. We draw near to God. This language, the verb, draw near, is egizo. And it means for us to approach in the intimacy of a family member. That's actually what it means, to draw near. It means to approach someone with the same intimacy you use when you're approaching a family member. See, my, my son, Xavier, has two ways of approaching me. And if you have kids, you probably know they have a couple ways of approaching you as well. The first way of approaching me is when he got, gets on the bus and he strikes another child. And he hits that child and then the teacher finds out about it and then all of a sudden we find out about it and he walks in the house and he knows what time it is. 
You already know what I'm talking about. When, when, they, when they mess up at school, they walk into the house like, I gotta go study right away. I'm off to my room, I'm off to my room, I'm off to my room. I hope no one notices that I'm in the building today. I'm off and on my room. And, and, and then you say, Xavier, why don't you get over here? We got to talk. He already knows. And he walks in like kind of keeping his distance, <laughs> observing and keeping his distance. And, and the guilt and the shame. And then you say, what, what happened today? All of a sudden, they forget how to talk. I was just thinking, I was just, when, what day, what day, what day? What day? When are we at? What, what moment of life? What day? I don't remember. I wasn't on. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Because when you go before your father with a guilty conscience, with the dirt, all you see is judgment. And you're, you just, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to know, I don't want to, oh, God, God. And, we, and we, we hide from God. We hide from God. But, you know, little Xavier, this past week, he had a, um, you know, they, he's too young. They don't even have A's and B's, but they have, like, a weekly thing, like, doing good, not doing good, really not doing good. I don't know what letters they were. <laughs> and, and they list all these things down. But this week, it was, like, perfect on the doing really good side. So he walks in on Friday, and I said, Xavier, how was your week? He was like, he took his coat, like he took his coat off, was like, I'm glad you asked. Reaches in his bag, grabs his paper, he's like, boom, gives me the paper, jumps on me like, Dad, what are we doing today? And I'm there like, yeah, my man, you did so good today, yeah, you know. And it's just like this love fest that's, that's happening. <laughs> See, you got to realize something. We will never, ever appear before God with that bad report card. See, some of us come there and we still think our conscience isn't cleansed and we're hiding. I don't want to talk to God. I don't want to see God. I don't, I don't know if he sees me right now. Uh, I don't know what would happen if I died today. I better not die today because maybe he wouldn't understand how I had did that thing. And we get bogged down in this stuff. But when you realize, mm, 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 when you realize, that when you come into Christ, your conscience has been cleansed. See, you don't just walk in without the shame and the guilt and the doubt and the fear. You walk in and then he doesn't realize that on your report card it says, I'm covered by the blood of Jesus which means that when you actually get in his presence, you walk in and you show him, Je Jesus is all over me. And God began, come on in, son. What can we do today? Oh, my goodness. It makes the father's heart proud. You've been drawing close to him, not realizing the price that Jesus has paid, how he has cleansed us. Perfect. Perfect. For we will all know God. He will be our God, and we will be his people. And no one will say, here is what I know about the Lord. For all of us can know him now. Every person here can know him. Let us draw near to our Father. This is very simple. If you don't have, and Joey, come on up. Help me out, brother. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you will always walk in fear and guilt. And sin will always be reminding you of its power. But when you wake up and realize that Christ paid it all, you are restored and cleansed and perfect, which the law could never do. We don't have to go day by day and offer sacrifices. Amen. 
So with everybody praying in this moment, and this is just a free gift. If you don't know Jesus today, and you're living in fear, and you don't know, you just, all you have to do is accept him. Accept his free gift and his free sacrifice in your life. If that's you today, with every, every person praying, I want you to just lift your hand up. If there's anyone, this is a call for salvation now. I don't know if you're already saved. If you don't know Jesus as your savior, I want you to lift your hand up. Is there anybody today? that wants access to the Father. If that's you, I want you to lift your hand. If there's anyone today under the sound of my voice, the Bible says today we see you in the back, young lady. I'm going to ask if Mrs. King and a couple people can gather around her. Is there anyone else? Today is a day of salvation for you. Is there anyone else? Miss King, would you mind just gra get just grab a couple ladies, some of our prayer team. Just stand over there. Tony, why don't you start moving out right now? Right now in the back. Is there anyone else? Today is the day of salvation. The Bible says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before the Father. God is in this. He's watching this. Church, keep praying. Keep praying. If there's anyone else, we don't, want you to, we don't want you to miss this moment. Well, church, let us all pray together and join with this young lady. Let's just pray together. Father, Everyone just repeat after me. Father, I thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. I recognize my sinfulness and that I could never do it on my own. But we realize that Jesus paid the price. I accept his sacrifice on my behalf and now I will draw near to my dad in Jesus name amen amen church why don't we stand together hallelujah and I want to challenge you this might not be a salvation message for you but I came here today to remind you of something that he's your father and you have access and you can draw near at any moment. So I want us to just take the next few minutes and stretch our hands forward and begin to draw near to God. Talk to him like he's your father, church. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Just begin to give him praise. Begin to talk to him. Begin to love on him. Begin to express your heart to him. Realize that you're walking in with a cleansed conscience. There's nothing you have to be ashamed of. In the Old Testament said, who would draw near to God? Those with clean hands and a pure heart. God has purified us and cleansed us. And we can walk in his presence. Lord, we lift your name on high, Jesus. Lord, we lift your name on high, Jesus. Lord, we thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody needs to worship him a little bit more. Lord, we lift your name on high, Jesus. Lord, we lift your name of Jesus. Lord, we bow before you, Jesus. Lord, we bow before you, Jesus. Lord, you made a way. Did he make a way for you? Draw near, church. Lord, you made a way. Lord, we worship you. We worship you. Somebody give God just a little bit more praise in this place. God bless you, church. Love you. Draw near to God. Hallelujah. Isn't that a blessing? Isn't that a blessing? The veil has been torn. Isn't it wonderful that we don't have to drag goats and rams and bulls up in here just to feel clean? Hallelujah. Bless God. Bless God. Bless God. Amen. It doesn't get any better than that. Hallelujah.